you're either in one of two situations. You have a kick that you know works with your track, but it just ain't cutting the mustard. Or you're a mixing engineer and a client sends you a track and you know that you can't just swap out the kick because it's gonna be too obvious. So today we're gonna be taking a look at how to deal with particularly shit kicks. Hey, what's up everybody? It's Fabio from Noise. Uh, I wanna just quickly share this birthday card that my parents got for me. I think it's a particularly accurate representation of uh, any studio dweller, especially the googly eyes. I'm really enjoying taking you on this journey so far with music, mixing, production, and even more so my hair, which is starting to look like Kit Harrington from Stranger Things. But we'll see if the mullet's necessary. Anyway, before we get started, please remember to hit that like and subscribe button. Show some love, show some support. I'm gonna bring you these videos twice every week. And on top of that, on Instagram Live, I will be streaming mixing and mastering sessions once a week. So go follow me there if you wanna watch me do my thing. So let's jump right in. Okay, it's pretty good, it's dirty, it's punchy, but is it really gonna cut through? I also need to play it to you in context, which I would be allowed to do if this wasn't a client's track which was about to get released. So, try and imagine it with everything else. Now my first issue with this kick was the boxiness, the kind of muddiness, and the lack of presence in the top end. So, I hit it with this Pro Q3. I'm gonna go through the different points. I'm gonna start with the one that was most important to me, which is this middle one here. Let's just take that in and out and hear the difference before and after. It's amazing just by taking out a certain group of frequencies, how that can open up a sound entirely. After I'd done that, I realized that I wanted more presence, so I boosted around the 3K range, which is quite a nice area for kicks. I'm generalizing here, remember all kicks are different, so make sure you're mixing to your sound, not copying my settings. Let's take a listen to this boost I made. And then last but not least, I still felt it was a little muddy in the low mids, so I took out a little bit at 170 hertz. Let's hear a before and after, without and then with all of these EQ points. Now, if you ask me, that's night and day. Of course, I didn't stop there. I didn't think that that was enough for the kick. So I went ahead and opened probably my favorite plugin at the minute, which is the Joey Sturgis, Joey Sturgis, I think I got that right, Tones Multiband Transient Shaper. So you can shape the attack and sustain of each different band. You can set them yourselves. And uh, it's okay, it's not the most amazing plugin. I do love it though. If you push it too hard, it kind of breaks and that can be quite cool too. But if you use it subtly, it is really, really good at kind of doing what an EQ would do, but by adding attack or taking away release slash sustain. Now, all I did here was I boosted the attack in the range from 5,000 to, I think the treble starts at 12,000. And I pulled down the sustain between 2,000 and 5,000. Now what I'll do is I'll turn this on and off and then exaggerate the changes that I made. Now I'll exaggerate them so you can hear even more clearly what I'm doing. So I'll increase this attack here and I'll pull down the sustain here. You see what I mean when you add too much, it just doesn't sound so good. So you wanna be really subtle when using something like this. Generally speaking, I like to clean things up with a digital EQ, shape it, get it to roughly where I want it. Then maybe I'll add saturation, compression, a transient shaper if necessary. And then I'll finish with an analog EQ. So I'm using the VEQ4 here by Waves, which I really like, very simple to use. And all I did was a two decibel boost at 3.3 kilohertz, so 3,300 kilohertz.
Let me exaggerate it for you. And just by adding that 3.3 hertz, we get a bit more of a knock, which means that it's gonna cut through on smaller systems. And when you add more high frequencies to a kick, sometimes you think that the kick is bigger than it actually is. You think that the kick is subbier than it actually is because your ears are picking up on those higher frequencies, which is really useful. So sometimes you don't need to boost your bass, you actually need to boost the higher frequency. All this talking got me thirsty. Being the perfectionist that I am, this obviously wasn't enough for me, so I went for one more thing and I wanted to do some parallel compression on the kick. It's not something I do often, but I just felt that it needed it. I wanted a little bit more punch and a little bit more flavor from it, so I sent it to an SSL G bus and then I dialed in as much as I need. So I'm gonna turn it on and off again and then we'll exaggerate it so you can hear the difference. Here's just the parallel compression. I can imagine that's quite quiet at your end, but that's what I'm mixing in. Now let's add it to the kick and turn it on and off. Now I'll exaggerate it a little bit so you can really hear what's going on. it just gives it that much needed oomph. And that is one little part of four big parts that help this kick sound the way it needs to. So what I'll do now is just turn everything on and off. So we'll do off first and then on after so you can hear where we started and where we've ended up. That's a huge difference. Okay, kick number two. Now this kick was quite different. Again, kind of dirty and I wasn't really feeling it. You know, I think you have to feel these things. Of course, we're trying to get there in a very technical way, but if the kick doesn't feel good, especially in something like dance music, which it's the bass, it's the root, it's the most important part, apart from maybe the bass, we need to make sure that it's gonna cut through the mix and cut through any system, especially a club one. So, let's have a listen to the kick unprocessed first. Not bad, nice and dirty. Sounds like a kind of distorted 909 or maybe an 808. Now the first thing I wanted to do was get rid of that tail. I didn't, wasn't feeling the tail and rather than using the Joey Sturgis tones, which is a multi-band transient shaper, I just used a regular one. I didn't feel like I needed to focus on one frequency area, so I'm just using the Native Instruments Transient Master. Now, there are loads of transient shapers out there. The SPL one is definitely one of my favorites, but I don't have that on this computer. I got this one for free, so I use it. They're all pretty much the same thing. And there are some really good ones native to DAWs as well. Logic has the enveloper, Ableton has the drum bus, you just gotta use the little transient dial on it. Let's hear what this kick sounds like with and without the transient master. I'll try and exaggerate it again so you can hear exactly what's going on. Now, what I did here was actually pull away some of the sustain, so some of the tail, and I also pulled away some of the attack because I wasn't digging how punchy it was. It just felt a little bit too forceful, especially on my smaller speakers. Let me exaggerate those so you can hear exactly what I'm talking about. In my mind, I'm obviously thinking a few steps ahead. I know that I'm gonna add some punch back later in one way or another, so I'm not too worried about taking a little bit out at this stage. Okay, next I hit it with the Pro Q3. Very similar to the last kick, but a little bit more aggressive. So let's start with the most important cuts and then we'll go into the smaller ones. So again, we've got this sort of big cut 
in the mid frequencies. This one's at 500, pretty wide as well. And it just took out a lot of that boxiness, which I didn't really feel was doing much for me. It did keep the kit kind of dirty. And I, I, I like that, you know, you want to maintain some character, but I wasn't in love with it. And I knew again that later on down the line in the chain, I was going to make up for anything I lost with a different plugin. So let's hear that on and off, just that band. See how that opens up the kick. It just makes things sound so much better. You can hear the low frequencies more and you can hear the high frequencies more. Next, I added just a 24 decibel low cut at around 30 Hertz. Sometimes I actually use a sharper decibel per octave. I, I usually go for 12 or 18, but I went for 24 in this case because I felt like it added some punch. It added a bit of tone. The sharper you go with your slope, the more of a boost will appear around this area here. So you're kind of enhancing, you're kind of cutting and boosting at the same time and just listen out for those changes. I see a lot of people go to 48 decibels per octave and it's usually just an aesthetic choice. People just do it because they think that's what they're supposed to do. You have to be careful of what you're gonna be boosting there. So I would actually say 24 decibels maximum unless you really, really have to cut everything out below that. But um, make sure you're tuning into any changes occurring when you do. Okay, next I had another little dip at 200 and then a boost around 50 and a boost around 2K. So I'll add those all in one go and then we'll have a look at the before and after. Let's hear it without the EQ and then with. Now the one thing this kick really lacked was sub. You need sub in a kick. You don't need too much, but you don't want too little. Now this is a free plugin that you can all download. It's called Bark of Dog by Boz Digital Labs. Uh, I, I think the original is called Voice of God, which you can get by UAD. I actually think it's a real unit, so it's just a play on that. Um, and I'm just using it to boost or harmonically excite 47 hertz. Just felt good for me at 6.2 dB, which seems like a lot, but this kick didn't have very much down there in the first place. So the idea is with this plugin, you kind of want to boost, kind of overdo it, and then sweep with the frequencies, find that sweet spot, and then pull it down, tame it a little bit. So uh, I even pulled the output down, as you can see. Let's hear without and then with. just gives a little bit of welly down there. It needs that nice body to help carry it through the club system. When it comes to boosting low frequencies, which I wanted to do more of on this sound, I always reach for one particular EQ, and that's the Neve 31102. I don't know what it is about this plugin, but the low shelf boost at 35 hertz is golden. It's absolutely beautiful. It's not muddy, it's not punchy, it's not too smooth, it's just magical. and I've always reached for this. This is like my top, top plugin for boosting at 35 hertz. It, it just sounds amazing. So let's just hear with and without. You know what? I actually think I could add a little bit more to this kick. So I'm just going to go to 3000 hertz and give a bit of a bell boost there as well. That is just a, a, a beautiful sounding EQ. I, I can't get over how good that is. And I, I mainly use it for things like this. Last but not least, I'm just using an overdrive plugin. This is Logic's stock overdrive plugin. Ableton has a fantastic one too. Any overdrive plugin will do. I'm using this to clip the sound a little bit so I can get some more volume out of it and to add back some of that dirty tone that we took away with the first Pro Q3. So here it is with and without. Now that's incredibly subtle, I'll agree, but let's have a listen to the kick now 
without everything and then with, and I think you're gonna be kind of shocked. And the thing is, sometimes these plugins make such a small difference, and if you're not really listening out or you're not really understanding what effect the plugin is going to have on the sound, then it can be difficult to see how that incremental step can be part of the bigger picture. So after I've mixed something, what I like to do is I turn all the plugins off and on. And just to see where I started from, I also like to check that my gain staging is correct this way. So I look at the meters and I make sure that I'm not gaining anything. In fact, in an ideal situation, I want the perceived loudness to be higher, but the metered loudness to be lower or pretty much the same. So here's without and then with. On the meter, it's coming up at about two decibels quieter. So I've just added a little bit more on the last plug in the overdrive to try and match the volumes just at the meter. And let's use our ears to see if the before the after is actually louder. That's still showing up as half a decibel louder, but it sounds so much punchier, clearer. It's still dirty, it's still got the character, but we're just accentuating everything that sounds good in that kick. So, again, I'd love to play it to you in context. The only problem is, this is a client's track and I can't reveal it. It hasn't been released yet. That would not be very loyal of me. So, you know, if you guys are ever sending me your tracks and I'm gonna mix the kick, I'm never gonna reveal who you are. I never do anything like that because you know, it's that kind of doctor confident, confidentiality, conf confidentiality, confidentiality. It's kind of like that doctor confidentiality agreement, if you know what I mean. Guys, it's been a pleasure as always. Get mixing your kicks. Don't worry if it doesn't sound perfect. Make sure it works with your track and then use some of these techniques to enhance anything that needs to be enhanced or taking away anything that's blocking up the pretty parts of your sound. Not the most technical sentence I've put together in my life, but anyway, before you go, please remember to hit that like and subscribe button, and I'll see you very soon. It's a big love from Noise. Peace.